Welcome everyone to this evening's session of the New Colombo Plan Momentum Series, Shaping a Stronger Future Together, a New Colombo Plan initiative brought to you by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and tonight in collaboration with PricewaterhouseCooper. My name is Saray McGinley, and I will be your moderator for this evening's session, in which we'll be exploring ASEAN and Australian relationships with a focus on education and services. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that this evening's session is taking place on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. I would like to pay my respects to the elders of these sovereign nations, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge their continuing contributions and connections to this region's landscapes, waterways, and communities. I would also like to extend these respects to any First Nations people joining us here today at the Diplomatic Academy or online via our live stream. By way of introduction, I'm a 2018 New Colombo Plan Mobility Grant recipient for Vietnam, a 2020 New Colombo Plan Scholar for Fiji, and was a 2020 Newcrest Mining Sponsored Scholar. I'm currently finishing my last semester of a double degree in International Development and Environmental Science at the Australian National University, and I'm working on Federal Climate Change Policy at the Clean Energy Regulator. Of course, we're also joined here this evening by a very fantastic and most distinguished panel of guest speakers. We have Gabby Costigan, CEO of BAE Systems Australia. Gabby joined BAE Systems Australia as a Chief Executive Officer in October 2017. As CEO, she is responsible for one of the nation's largest defence companies, which has supported the Australian Defence Force for 65 years. Gabby retired as a colonel in the Australian Army after a distinguished career that included operational experience, providing logistic operations support for Australian and US deployed military forces. Gabby brings to BAE Systems a broad range of experience as a senior executive in international logistics, aviation and supply chain management domains. This includes her appointment as CEO for Lynn Fox International Group, during which she focused on transforming the business with an emphasis on strong customer service and high standards in safety and integrity across the region. She's a former member of the Australian ASEAN Council, promoting Australia's interests in Southeast Asia. Gabby was a strong supporter of the Council's focus to initiate and support activities to enhance awareness, understanding and links between people, business and institutions in Australia and Southeast Asia. Gabby has recently been appointed Chair of the Council for Women and Families United by Defence Services, and this forum provides women and families a direct connection to the Minister's Office to raise issues affecting Defence members and their families. Finally, Gabby has been honoured for her military service by the Australian and US governments and NATO. She was awarded a Most Excellent Order of the British Empire for services to UK and Australia relations. We also have joining us online Andrew Parker, Partner and Asia Practice Leader of PricewaterhouseCooper and a New Colombo Plan business champion. Andrew is a Sydney-based partner at PwC, where he leads the Australian firm's Asia practice. Andrew joined Price Waterhouse Cooper in 1985, became a partner in 1999, and spent 12 years in PwC's London, Moscow, and Jakarta offices. Andrew has a long association with Asia, having lived and worked in Indonesia, and was the leader of PwC's Asia telecom industry until 2012, a role he held for nearly 10 years. Andrew is a member of the leadership group of the Business Council of Australia's Asia Task Society, Asia Task Force. He's also a non-executive director of the Australian Indonesia Centre at Monash University in China Matters, a member of the executive committee of the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee, and a member of the advisory board of the Asia Society. Finally, we also have Ray Marcello joining us this evening, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades, Southeast Asia Regional Engagement Branch. Ray has served at the Australian Embassy in Jakarta, led DFAT's Parliamentary and Media Branch and ASEAN Desk, and has performed roles as Deputy Speechwriter in the Office of the Trade Minister. Before joining DFAT, Ray was a journalist, including an assignment as New Delhi correspondent with the Financial Times. He speaks Bahasa Indonesia, Filipino, and is learning Mandarin. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Will Nankervis, Australian Ambassador to the Australian Mission to the Australian, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Previously, Will was the Assistant Secretary of the Indo-Pacific Strategy and Regional Maritime Branch in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where his responsibilities included implementation of Australia's Indo-Pacific Strategy, as well as regional maritime security issues. Mr. Nankervis was a member of the task force that developed Australia's 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, and prior to that, he headed the DFAT Iraq and Syria Task Force. He was the political counsellor in Australia's permanent mission to the United Nations in New York during Australia's term on the UN Security Council. As a career DFAT officer, Mr. Nankervis has also undertaken postings in short-term missions in Sri Lanka and Solomon Islands. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics and a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics and Philosophy from the University of Queensland. 
Now, for housekeeping, in terms of tonight's event, the panel discussion will be running till 5 p.m. and will include an opportunity for audience questions. And for those of you who are joining us online, uh, please pop your questions into the uh, WebEx chat box. From 6 p.m., we will also have an opportunity for networking and drinks here at the Diplomatic Academy, which I encourage you all to stick around for. Now, let's get to the good stuff. I don't think anyone has captured it quite as simply as Penny Wong, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, when she said, Australia's future and our future prosperity are inevitably in Asia. Indeed, our relationship with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is absolutely central to this fact. Since becoming the first dialogue partner of ASEAN in 1974, Australia has shared a deep and dynamic relationship with ASEAN member states, founded on principles of mutual cooperation, shared security, shared prosperity, and connections. Our relationship with ASEAN is multifaceted, encompassing a diversity of evolving agendas and issues. A topic that has always been central to our relationship, however, is that of education and services. This is a topic we've heard leaders in government, the private sector, and academia make broad, sweeping statements about for some time. But since becoming a dialogue partner in 1974, our world has changed immeasurably. The rise of Asia, the forces of globalization, shifting geopolitical tensions, and indeed COVID-19 have fundamentally changed our region. The opportunities and challenges for Australia and ASEAN are not the same as they were 50 years ago, 10 years ago, or even 18 months ago. So in tonight's session, I'm really keen to bring this conversation of education and services and the role it plays in our relationship with ASEAN into the now. My overarching question for tonight is whether Australia is truly harnessing the value of education and services to our relationship with ASEAN in a way that is sufficiently responding to and anticipating contemporary challenges in our region. To get us started, I'd like to invite the Australian Ambassador to ASEAN, Mr. Will Nankervis, to kick off this evening's session by sharing some opening reflections on the contemporary ASEAN-Australia relationship and how he sees education and services fitting in the picture. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a bit of a thunderstorm in Indonesia at the moment. So hopefully, you can, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, well, look, a, a really warm welcome to our guests, to New Colombo Plan scholars and alumni, mobility students, and those, of course, who are joining us at the main event in Canberra and from overseas locations. I'm really happy to welcome you all to this, uh, what is the second session of the Momentum Series, Shaping a Stronger Future Together. And of course, as our ambassador to ASEAN, especially pleased to participate in this session, Australia ASEAN Education and Services, co-hosted by DFAT and PwC. Um, I understand my colleague, Andrew Goldzanowski, High Commissioner to Malaysia, uh, really welcomed the opportunity to open the first session last week. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of Gabby Costigan, CEO BAE Systems, who is not only a member of the ASEAN Australia Business Council or Australian ASEAN Business Council and an NCP business champion, but a great leader who never stops promoting Australia's interests in the region. Thanks also to our session sponsor, Andrew Parker. Good to see you again, Andrew. Um, Andrew's partner and, as we've heard, an Asia practice leader of PwC Australia and NCP business champion. Um, thanks to you and your whole team for your really long and steady support for the NCP, uh, hosting interns, sponsoring scholarships, creating job pathways for the broader NCP community. And I'd like to also recognise my colleague, Ray Marcello. G'day, Ray. Uh, not least, I would like to thank our chair, Soraya McGinley, NCP alumna from 2020, uh, who's going to chair this, this session. Thank you, Soraya. So ASEAN's really central to Australia's foreign policy. If you look at recent speeches from our prime minister or, uh, or foreign minister, uh, even the address that the Prime Minister gave at the start of the year when he was outlining his priorities for 2021, uh, ASEAN always gets a very strong mention, uh, and they'll always talk about ASEAN centrality. Um, the Prime Minister and Prime Minister are both fond of saying ASEAN is central to our vision for a stable, prosperous and inclusive Indo-Pacific region. So, 
ASEAN is important for a few reasons. Uh, I can talk about this all day, but I, I won't. I'll just quickly mention three. It's been central to underpinning regional stability. Secondly, it's the key rule and norm setting body in the region. So what ASEAN says matters, what ASEAN says about the way states should engage uh, uh, and the culture in the region, the degree of adherence to rules and norms um, is all really important for, for, for setting the regional order in the Indo-Pacific. Thirdly, ASEAN is the strategic convener. So every year, ASEAN leads the forum, the East Asia Summit, for example, that brings together the president of the US, leaders from China, uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, of course, to talk about the big, big strategic issues. And I could add a fourth, which is relevant to the, to the topic today, which is the role of ASEAN in economic integration and driving economic integration in the region. So COVID-19 has really shown that uh, Australia and ASEAN's futures are, are intertwined. We know that none of us will be safe until we're all safe. And of course, a couple of months ago, the first doses of COVID-19 vaccines arrived in Australia on a Singapore Airlines flight. So as really close neighbours and key trading partners, we will need to share a path to recovery from, from COVID-19. We know that service sectors, travel and tourism industries affected by movement restrictions are likely to remain pretty hard hit, even as we see recovery in manufacturing and trade in goods. Uh, and, this, and with this in mind, ASEAN's commitment to free trade and open markets in the face of global headwinds is really important. And I think I want to particularly mention and welcome the signing of RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in November last year. It sent a really important signal at a time when there was, of course, a temptation to look inwards of ASEAN's commitment to trade liberalisation and openness. RCEP brings together our top regional trading partners into a single economic framework anchored in ASEAN and will link us more, more closely to this dynamic region. Um, so we hope uh, and believe that Australian businesses will really benefit further from regional value chains and this will contribute to jobs and growth. Uh, in Australia as well as across the region. We really, Australia really stepped up our engagement with ASEAN last year in the context uh, of, the, of the global pandemic. Um, our Prime Minister at the, at the uh, ASEAN Australia Summit late, late last year, a uh, landmark series of initiatives, a big package and you no know, Ray was very involved in putting that together. The joys of thunderstorms in Jakarta. Uh, uh, you can still hear me. I think the connection is great. In, uh, if you can still hear me, I'd just like to say that ASEAN and Australia share really strong people to people connection. Okay, well, that, that's probably a good signal for me to wrap up quickly, I think. Uh, I was just talking about people to... Okay. Oh. <laughs> I was talking about people to people connections, which are, which, are, which are surviving and thriving, even despite the pandemic and the long distances and now uh, online communication. Uh, and this is certainly a good example of the challenges involved, uh, but but uh, the ways that we're able to, to overcome and keep connections going. Um, Australia and ASEAN have at the highest level committed to further strengthen people-to-people -people links with a special focus on investing in enduring connections between future leaders. The contribution of education, sports, arts and cultural exchange programs between ASEAN and Australia and especially the new Colombo plan will keep deepening those linkages, social and cultural linkages 
and strengthen people to people links between ASEAN and Australia. I'd like to really recognise the contribution of NCP scholars uh, and NCP business, uh, business champions. And once again, welcome you all to what promises uh, to be a great ASEAN Australia discussion in the Momentum series. Thank you very much. And apologies again for the connectivity issues. Thank you. Thanks very much, Will, uh, for those opening remarks. Gabby, I might ask you the first question to kick off our discussion. Sure. In a recent edition of the ASEAN magazine, which was themed ASEAN Youth Powering into the Future, the Singaporean Minister for Education, Mr. Lawrence Wong, said that Singapore recognises that education is about much more than book knowledge and academic abilities. It is also about instilling with our children key traits like communication and teamwork, as well as creative and innovative thinking that will enable them to succeed. Based on your experiences of working in the ASEAN region, and perhaps you might like to provide an example, what do you think are the key traits and skills that young Australians need to succeed in ASEAN? And do you think that the Australian education sector is doing enough to really prepare us for that challenge? Okay, uh, good question, big question. Um, yes, I do think the Australian education system is, um, or maybe not doing enough, but it has certainly stepped up, um, I think, in what children need now, uh, you know, to focus on for their future careers. Um, in terms of the sorts of traits that, you know, me as a business leader, if I think about what we're looking for, um, in, in new employees and, and young people, and particularly, you know, whether it's in Australia or across the region, a couple of key traits, I guess. One, I would, I would definitely encourage people to focus on their language skills. Um, the opportunity to learn a second language, um, you know, it's, that's gold. Um, that will take you all over the world. Um, you know, so I would certainly uh, encourage people, if, if, you know, if they've got that ability to focus on getting a second or a third language, if they can. Uh, another area, I guess, that I, I have found through my own career, um, and I've worked, um, well, across, I ran a business across Southeast Asia, uh, across seven countries there, or eight countries, and also in India and uh, China, um, is, you know, develop your networking skills. Um, you know, networking, building relationships, um, you know, and you can start that in school, um, you know, in high school and primary school even. Um, develop those networks um, because those networks will help you throughout your career. Um, it could even just be, you know, in starting with a sporting team or then moving into, uh, you know, a, a, you know, it could be any anything. But develop those networks. Uh, find the people who interest you. Learn from them. Um, talk to them. Ask questions. Uh, you know, be open to learning every day is probably uh, another key trait, I would say. Um, leadership skills are probably the most important, I would say. Having, you know, being able to work across multiple countries or go into different cultures, uh, you know, first you've got to have, I think, the ability to understand the social uh, dynamic and the cultural experiences that you'll have in, in different places that you work, um, you know, and developing your leadership skills, your ability to speak publicly, um, to engage with people from all different walks of life um, is very important as well. So, and I do think now the Australian education system sees that those soft skills that people need, not just the, you know, the book skills, are really important. So, you know, you'll see a lot of schools now who are focused on doing different things to develop young people's um, leadership ability, exposing them to different things, whether it's through basic things like debating, uh, public speaking opportunities, uh, working with sport, working, you know, exchange programs with different schools, those sorts of things. So I guess they're probably my key ones. Yeah, networking, leadership and language skills. Thank you, Gabby. I think you've just summed up the new Colombo plan pretty well. <laughs> I might throw the next question to you, Andrew. Andrew, as far back as 2014, you have been commenting on the need for Australia to seriously think about the way we invest in and engage with Asia. Recently, you reaffirmed this sentiment in the Business Council of Australia's Asia Task Force paper titled A Second Chance, How Team Australia Can Succeed in Asia. I should flag that this paper mentioned the new Colombo plan on a number of occasions, so thank you for that, Andrew. My question for you is, Andrew, when you were talking about Australia's second chance to succeed in Asia, particularly in ASEAN, how do you see education and services coming into the mix? Well, they're um, very important parts of our 
you know, overall export mix, actually, um, I think many, many people, many Australians perhaps don't fully appreciate just how significant the uh, education sector is and, and the, the um, tourism sector is to, to Australia's export mix. Um, you know, when we talk about the sort of the big five Australian exports, um, you know, iron ore, I guess most people would guess coal, natural gas, um, gold and beef um, are the, the, the top five. But, but actually, if you put services into that mix, um, number four and number five are education and, and tourism. So they're, they're really, really important parts of our mix. The, the other thing which is, um, which is particularly important about both of those, those two um, services exports is, is, is the, the goodwill that it builds within in the region and the knowledge that it builds within the region and the networks that it builds. So you, know, you mentioned um, the, the, the new Colombo plan and the benefits of the new Colombo plan to Australian students. Um, you know, many of the people that I've um, interacted with over the years, particularly now at, 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 a, at a more senior level, um, have themselves been beneficiaries of, of the original Colombo plan. Um, and many of their children have come to Australian universities and, and studied at Australian universities. And, 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 and the importance of that, not only um, you know, in, in the government to government relationship, um, but also in in business life is is very hard to to overstate and and it's I think it is a a particular asset that Australia has that we haven't um, you know exploited as as well as we could do and and one that I think you know if we're going to be really successful in the region and achieve the kind of the goals and objectives that we've set um, this is an area where where we could um, we could do a lot better for ourselves. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Ray, I might throw a question to you now, sort of building off the comments of um, Gabby and Andrew. I'd be interested in your thoughts as someone um, working with government who's got experience with diplomacy and some diverse language skills. How does education and services feed into the idea of building people-to-people -people links, soft power, diplomacy? And how does that feed into your work? Um, thanks for the question. The, 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 the new Colombo plan, I see the new Colombo plan as both benefiting not just the participants who've done it, but it's a national capability, and in fact, it's a sovereign capability for Australia. If we didn't have the new Colombo plan, uh, we would be years behind uh, our engagement with the region. So the fact that we've built up thousands of, of Australians with capability in the region, in, in Southeast Asia, in particular in the Pacific, uh, we now have uh, in, our, in our stocks uh, a, a workforce and a, and, a, and a group of citizens who are aware and have on-the-ground experience working and living in the region. That's not just good for business, but it is, it is good for the country. Um, I do see language capability and knowledge of our neighbours as a sovereign capability, and if we don't invest in that, we are re it is a vulnerability for, for the country. So I see it in quite serious terms in, in a way. If we... If we and so, again, we, we, we're thankful that NCP exists, but uh, we need to keep investing in those, not just the NCP, but the, the education systems that produce uh, graduates that have got awareness of the region. And as you say, Gabby, the leadership skills and networking skills, those things are prized by our partners in the region. And so, um, but where are we today? We're in a difficult position because... We've closed our borders, which is good for us here. We can all shake hands in Canberra. But we've got a lot of ground to make up uh, in both welcoming students back into Australia and also sending our, our young people and the people who have done NCP back to the region. So, so obviously, we, we have a, a, a big job to do to, to uh, ensure the safety of our fellow citizens in Australia. But we've got a lot of ground to make up when, when, when we are ready to re-engage with the region. Gabby, I might throw to you now, sort of building on that comment. Um, I read in a speech that you received some advice from your grandma when you were young that's guided you throughout your career, and that is, if you don't ask, you don't get. A question that's certainly on my mind and that of many other NCP scholars is we talk about Asia capability, language skills, raised your shared being key assets to business and government in Australia. Hence why lots of students like myself pursue opportunities like the New Colombo Plan or study abroad. But I think many of us actually find it hard when we go uh, to seek out entry-level jobs to maintain a competitive advantage. 
I'd like to know from your, uh, your uh, business perspective, how does your organisation look to actively tap into a talent pool of young Australians with Asia capabilities and experience in the region? Okay. Um, well, firstly, it is, and I, I think I can probably speak for many businesses in Australia, that we're always looking for um, people that have international uh, experience um, because it brings, um, you know, so many benefits to the individual when they come to work in your organisation. Um, and, it, you know, I don't think it matters what your organisation is. Um, just those opportunities to have, uh, you know, different social and cultural experiences um, different learnings, uh, you know, your maturity level changes because you're, you're, you're dealing with different things, your ability to uh, negotiate, to uh, be a decision maker, all those sorts of things. You Having those experiences overseas, you, you learn so much more. Um, you know, so I see that as a real asset that you could bring to my organisation. Um, you know, so I think, you know, and it's actually for... Exec so I'm in a global business. Um, BAE Systems in Australia is uh, the largest defence company in Australia. Um, and we operate all over the world. Um, I run the Australian business and uh, with a focus on Asia uh, as well. And for our executives in our business, so sort of middle management and above, um, you know, you are, if you've got international experience, you know, you, you go on the, the high pot list or the high potential list. So it is a, certainly an asset for you. So I would encourage um, all of you to continue to pursue that, uh, those opportunities when they're presented to you. And don't just take one. You know, I've, I mean, I've lived all over the world and, you know, I've had so many different experiences and I've worked all over the world, um, you know, and they've helped shape me um, and my leadership style, um, certainly now. Um, you know, so I would certainly encourage, encourage that. Um, in terms of, I guess, tapping into the market, um, you know, for young people at that entry level, businesses now don't just look at your CV, you know. Um, this is a very competitive marketplace in Australia and same in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, so we, we need to know who is the person that's going to work in our organisation. What are your values? What do you believe in? Um, you know, Businesses like mine, you know, we all, you know, each business has its own culture, right? And, um, you know, I need to know that the people who are working in my business, um, you know, believe in our culture, um, believe in the values of our organisation. Um, you know, so I would encourage people to be really clear on what their values are, what they stand for, um, because when you interview for a role, that's something that's really important to business. Um, you know, those businesses are investing in you and many businesses these days will give you so many opportunities for further education, to send you overseas, those sorts of things for different opportunities. Um, so if they're going to invest in you, they want you to invest in their organisation. Um, you know, so I think that's probably enough. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Andrew, it was certainly something that came through the Asia Task Force report supporting NCP scholars. Um, from a PwC perspective, uh, how is your organisation looking to tap into the uh, the talent pool that is an NCP alumni cohort? Yeah, uh, look, I, I'd endorse um, you know what what Gabby has has said there about you know the importance of that that diversity. Um, it, it is interesting though. One of the things that we did um, identify in in the task force um, work was, was that. Um, there's a real, there is a real lack of um, Asia capability at the senior levels of of many Australian companies, um, and and that capability is is particularly apparent in in large companies, um, and and especially our listed the cohort of our listed companies, the ASX 200. And in fact, Asia Link um, published a study, uh, I think it was about July last year, where they they found that that only 10% of our ASX 200 companies had Asia capable executives in the, what, what what's they sort of refer to as, as the C-suite, just 10%, which is a stunning failure for corporate Australia. Um, we, you know, in, in our organization, we sort of, we look at that and, and I'm completely, you know, transparent at the senior levels, we also don't have the, the mix of, 
um, sort of diverse talent that I think that we're you know we're aiming to have. Um, but if I look at the the kind of graduates that we hire, the 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 um, young people that are walking through the door straight out of university, there's enormous diversity. I mean, half of them are, are, are women. Um, probably 30 something percent would be from an Asian cultural background. Um, and, and and well in excess of that, if you add in you know sort of non Anglo cultural backgrounds in in that sort of diversity um, metric, but but at a senior level, we we've we've put in place and have had in place since 2015 a, a target which we published on our website, which said that you know for the new partner admit, so this is a way of building over time um, that diversity into the partner group. Um, what we sort of refer to as 40, 40, 20. So 40 percent. Um, female, 40% male, the 20% in the middle could come from either either cohort. Um, but we also um, had a, a, another target which was aimed at diversity, which which was 30% of new partners admitted in 2020 had to be from a non sort of Anglo background. So that of, of course doesn't doesn't mean exclusively Asian cultural background, but it, you know clearly the Asian cohort is a is a significant. Cohort, so we, we've taken steps, positive steps, to to address it, and we've had to do that because just leaving it to the, you know, to the system, if you like, to 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 achieve that wasn't wasn't working for us, um, you know. And and I've had this discussion with many many of our clients, and you know, my my um, question to them, and and answer to them when they ask, well, why why is it important? Is it's it's actually pretty simple, you know. If 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 your board and your management team don't look like your customer or your target customer group, then you've got a problem, and 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 that problem is going to be a really big one um, at some point in the future. And so, so you know, if, if you look at the um, diversity of our community, we actually have to reflect that diversity in our organisations, not just at the you know graduate higher level, but at at the more at the more senior um, levels, and and this is not just a problem, by the way, of corporate Australia. I mean, it's pretty well documented that you know, in the public service and in in um, university sectors, you know, we've got a long way to go to achieve that. And and it's it's important because you know when I mentioned um, in the first question you asked, one of our one of our most significant assets, you know, is is that diversity of our community. There's not another country in the world that has a better diverse or a more diverse community than Australia, um, but it's a community that, that we don't, I think, fully um, tap into when we're looking at this question of how do we how do we become um, bigger and grow our, our economic interests in in the region. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I might zoom out now and throw to you, Ray, and uh, get discussion looking at the experience of education in ASEAN member states. So as was the case all across the world, COVID-19 hit the education sectors hard. As estimated that school closures in ASEAN affected the quality of education received by more than 152 million children and youths. Some are saying that 2020 was a lost year for the region's youth. Whilst member states made a tremendous effort to transition to remote learning schools, uh, schools were largely un underprepared. The digital infrastructure was not in place, device access was not universal, and many education institutions and households struggled to cope with the requirements. Commentators are noting that this, this really threatens to increase inequalities and negate progress made on poverty reduction in the region. What do you think are some of the key challenges faced by ASEAN member states when it comes to education and services and how is Australia providing the support? No, it's a big question. I, I certainly know firsthand from talking to our posts in Southeast Asia how hard it has been for, for young people to continue schooling. So. Typically, for example, our local staff in a, in a post in, in Indonesia will spend half their morning homeschooling their kids and then they'll spend the rest of the day working for the embassy. So that's a long day where, they, where, they, where they, they, they're already tired by the time they, 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 start, they open their, their DFAT laptop. Uh, in some cases, uh, we know that there's a shared computer in, in one household. So the kids are struggling to get access to that computer. So we can't underestimate, I don't think anyone is, but we can't underestimate the, just the sheer negative impact that the past year has had in Southeast Asia, as well as in countries like the Philippines and Indonesia at the moment, where we're still going through COVID 
a serious outbreak in COVID. Vietnam's just going through a new, a new phase of lockdown. So this is a continuing problem. And we will only really know the results of that in time by how, how much this has affected school age populations and university age populations. Um, DFAT really isn't responsible in a way for the, the educational services aspects. And I think, uh, I know that for example, our ambassador in Indonesia, he, he Gary, Gary Quinlan finished today um, and the new ambassador, Penny Willems, is about to start. But Gary made the point in, a, in, a, in an op-ed in, in the local media that there is, there is, a now, there is now, thanks to the, the frameworks that we've, we've agreed with Indonesia, uh, an Australian campus that can offer services to Indonesian students. Now, these are things that we can do through trade agreements and through uh, agreements that we strike with our partners in the region. So in time, once um, their own COVID protocols, uh, uh, they're, they're comfortable with their protocols, we can start offering these, these classes in person and Australian education service to Indonesian students on the ground. We're doing that in Malaysia and hopefully we can do that in more places across Indonesia. So these are things that we can facilitate through bilateral agreements. Um, on the other side, on the, on the development program, uh, we, we, we are seriously looking at how we can make up ground on basic education because uh, there's a serious impact on poverty, of course, with kids not being able to access schooling. Uh, we're going to have to work with our partners in uh, each of the countries across Southeast Asia to see what we can do to help rebuild or at least restore uh, the kinds of educational services that they have been providing uh, to, their, to their citizens. We don't have an education program in every country either. It's a function of our priorities. And in fact, uh, one of the things we've got to do is, is support our partners in the region and get their vaccination programs up and running. And that's one of the things we're doing. So let's get those vaccines rolled out. Let's get those support systems in place so they can roll out vaccines. Then we're talking about getting back to school. And you can see how complicated this situation is in Southeast Asia. So while you've made a really important point about uh, the role of education in poverty, a few things have to come into place first. And clearly, economic recovery is one of the things that the, our partners in Southeast Asia are looking for. And that's one of the things that... Um, I think Will was about to say before he cut out was uh, we, we are focusing on, on economic recovery and supporting our, our partners in Southeast Asia, get their economies back on track. Part of that is our own bilateral programs. Part of that is new programs that the Prime Minister announced last year, including this, the vaccine program that, that, uh, that I've just mentioned. I might just wait, make one final point on, on what Andrew mentioned before. Um, not just on diversity, I agree with what he was saying about the need for the public sector to reflect the community, um, but uh, business and government are in some ways um, a counterbalance for each other. He mentioned the Asia capability, or the lack of it in the ASX, ASX listed companies. Uh, conversely, certainly from when, I, when I speak to DFAT, we, we are, uh, well, we are not overweight, but we are heavily weighted uh, in, in Asia. So, Setting aside China, uh, Korea, uh, Japan, and India, Southeast Asia is has the highest concentration of Australian diplomats more than more than any other region in the world. So we have always prioritised Southeast Asia as part of Australia's foreign policy since we have since we had an independent foreign policy. So Southeast Asia has always been a consistent and constant uh, feature of Australian foreign policy. And those of you. NCP uh, participants who have spent time in Southeast Asia know how, uh, how deep our connections run across, um, across our partners. It's not just DFAT, it's, uh, it's across a range of government agencies, uh, it's, it's across a range of organisations and institutions. So it's a level of familiarity that we have in Southeast Asia that I think we, we, we need to continue. And the NCP uh, engagement in Southeast Asia, even though it's a new thing, it, it is part of a long-running, decades-old engagement with the region. Okay. I'm just looking at the time. I understand we've got some questions that have come through from our live audience. Uh, my fellow NCP alumni, Juliet's going to pass them through. Uh, thanks, Soraya. Um, so we've got a question um, coming from Bayan, who's one of the other um, NCP scholars. So um, he asks, 
uh, tens of thousands of international students from ASEAN nations do study in Australia. Um, and what contributions do you think um, that their um, Australian education can make to regional development upon their return home? Me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> look, this is um, this is hard to measure, but it is it is extremely important. Uh, the the contribution, the exposure that that uh, international students get of Australia and 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 their impression that uh, that they take back home has enormous effects. I think um, our former secretary Peter Bagi said, uh, you, "You can't you can't sell Australia effectively overseas. You have to see Australia and be in Australia." As Australians know, there's so much about uh, this country that you can only experience for yourself, and it's um, partly the it's partly a, a function of experience. So when 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 international students live here and study here and they interact with Australians, they get a sense of our values. You talked about that before, Gabby. They get a sense of our freedom. They get a sense of what we stand for, and they take that back home. And we've we've benefited from that uh, very clearly when we see um, alumni of Australian universities. Uh, who are now leaders in their communities back home, not just across government, but across all sorts of facets of society in Southeast Asia. The fact we can get a good flat white in Jakarta is because there are so many Indonesians who've studied in Melbourne <laughs> and Sydney, I should say. But it's that kind of cultural... I mean, that's, that's a pretty soft example, but we, we also have cabinet ministers who have studied in Australia and we have business leaders who understand where we come from. That might seem like a trite observation in a way, but when things... When there are tensions in relationships, as there often are, they know where we come from and we can rely on that when, as we resolve them. That's what I was saying earlier about networks. Mm. So the networks that students develop here while they're studying in Australia will carry them through their careers mm. um, and they become the best salespeople for our country as well because they go back and they talk about the amazing experiences that they've had as students here, the opportunity that you know, that they've been given, you know, to study and research here in Australia, um, you know, to be able to um, contribute to, you know, our, our national agenda as well um, because national, international students do do that um, and they take that back with them to their countries um, and they will, because of the positive experiences that they've had here, they will encourage their children, you know, and, and the like and that's how that, that circle continues. So it is very important. Uh, we had a second question. Oh, so I was just going to add a um, one um, further aspect to, to that question, if I could as well, is you know, when, when the students go home, they take home skills with them as well. And, and you know, for most of these countries in Southeast Asia, particularly, um, skills are desperately short. And, and so their, their economic development depends on the skills that, that they develop here in Australia at our educational institutions and they take home. Now, that's, that's very much in the interests of, of, of each of the, those countries to have those skills because that produces the economic um, development. But, but it's also very much in Australia's interest because, you know, a happy region makes for a, both a prosperous region for us to do business in, but it's also a safer region. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so we had another question from another NCP scholar, um, Oliver Pang, um, and he asks, how can Australia and ASEAN countries continue to forge links in education while borders um, do remain shut in the current pandemic and also in future pandemics? Did I answer that one again? <laughs> sure. I'll say a little and then. So, um, look, I think it's people are doing a heroic job at the moment really to maintain these connections. Um, where there are, where there's online engagement, and I, I know that's happening across a whole range of organisations, institutions, that will have to do for now. Uh, for example, one program that a small program that I've been involved in is um, the Indonesia Youth Exchange Program, and that that has been running for more than twenty years, and that's continued online as well. These are the these are the networking opportunities that we've been able to continue and that'll run again this year virtually. It's, no, it's not really as effective as, as, a, as a face to face on the ground experience, but we have to do those, those kinds of things just to keep those connections going. Um, I did mention before the example of the campus in Indonesia. Those, 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 uh, we just need to keep working at it to make sure that when we are ready, uh, we, can, we can 
we can really pick up uh, pick up uh, the ground that we we frankly have lost because our borders are shut. Oh, probably the only point I'd make is I think you know through the last twelve months, you know many of the academic institutions in Australia had to very much focus internally on how their organisations were going to continue to run, um, you know, and losing such a large uh, part of the population uh, of their international students. But one thing I think they'll probably focus on this year, um, you know, to, to build on those relationships internationally is many or most of the universities in Australia have sister or, or brother schools overseas. Um, you know, so that I would expect that they would focus on, you know, um, you know, joint opportunities to collaborate, and and you know, the only way to do that right now is online. Um, you know, so um, and I, you know, and I think people have, you know, certainly even in my own organisation, right, and we're a technology company. Um, you know, <laughs> we embrace technology like you wouldn't believe um, in this last twelve months. You know, the amount that we saved in travel. From a business perspective, um, you know, was was quite phenomenal. But business continued; we were able to continue to operate because we adapted, um, and that's what these academic institutions have to do. Is you know, they've had a year to build up their resilience, and now they've got to adapt, um, you know, so that we can continue that cultural exchange. Yeah, we might jump. Does anyone from the floor have any questions? We do have some additional questions from the online chat. Um, so one question that we had um, was from Bayan again. Um, and the question was, should the Australian education system prioritise the learning of Southeast Asian languages? Um, and yeah, question for the panellists was, um, why do you believe that Indonesian language study um, has been steadily decreasing in Australia um, over the past decade? Um, and can and should we reverse this trend? Andrew, I might start with you if you have any ideas. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, look, I think that's a really important important question. And, and as, as a country, we, we have to, you know, look look at at how we resolve this. Um, I think there's been some excellent papers written over the last, um, well, probably over, over a number of years, pointing out a decline in our um, Indonesian capability, which which is absurd when you think about you know the strategic importance of Indonesia. It just doesn't add up. Um, yet yet it is it is the case, and and it's not it's not just a question or a problem that that I think is is the responsibility of government. So, you know, we, we talked before about, you know, what it is that businesses look for in, in students. Well, I think, you know, part of the reason why enrolments have started to decline in some of these courses, which then forced universities to close um, courses, is, is that students are not seeing employment outcomes um, being influenced by that, that you know, that, that sort of, um, um, time that they spend studying. And so, so I think actually as a business community and a government, you know, we've got to get ourselves together and, and, and think about well, what are the strategic priorities for our country. Um, if Asia does feature in it, and I think everybody thinks that that is the case, then then what is it that we need to do to to improve the position and our capability? And and, and it seems pretty obvious to me that, that language has to be one of those things. And, um, you know, Indonesian um, is just one of the languages that, that we need to make available and invest in because you know it's. I think it's very well documented, and and anybody who's done, you know, any much time in the region and business in the region would would know that that those language capabilities are just so important. I mean, from a per personal perspective, um, I I knew nothing about Indonesian culture until I learnt the language, but but learning the language helped me enormously in understanding culture. Um, and I think that goes for you know Japanese. It goes for um, the you know various Chinese dialects. I'm sure it goes for the Indian dialects as well. Um, we, we probably won't be able to afford to to teach everybody every language, but I do think we need to have centres of excellence, and we need a we need a national approach to this. And 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 it's something that has been spoken about for for decades. 
Um, and, and, you know, if we really believe our future is in the region, um, it is something as a nation that we've got to get our heads together and solve. Um, I do think in the last decade, though, that Australian schools have pivoted um, to Asian languages, um, you know, or to offer Asian languages. Um, you know, I've got an 11-year-old who's studying Mandarin and I've got a nine-year-old who's doing Bahasa. Um, you know, and, and that's what the school offers. Um, you know, when I went to school, it was French and German. Um, you know, so there has certainly been a big pivot there um, because I think now the strategic importance of the region is understood. Um, you know, and I think what, what we need to be pushing our government to do, um, particularly the, the Minister for Education, is... You know, it used to be, you, it was mandated you did mathematics and English. Well, why isn't it mandated that we do a language? Um, you know, and it's about educating, I think, um, you know, the Australian community of the value of having that second language and what the opportunities um, that will open up for, uh, for people by having that opportunity. Um, you know, I mean, I think if you, if you went back to when I was a child, there was almost an ignorance, if you like, around having a second language. Um, you had a second language if your parents uh, came from you know, another country. Not many people were actively pursuing um, you know, language studies uh, back then because it wasn't really seen as uh, a benefit to you. Um, but it is certainly now, in the business community now, it is a sought after um, you know, skill, if you like. Um, yeah, so I think there's certainly more that can be done, but I do think there has been a pivot in Australia. Ray, did you want to share? Yeah, thanks. Um, Andrew's right. I mean, there, there has been plenty of studies about the, the decline of Asian language teaching. The questioner said, should we prioritise Southeast Asian languages above others? Um, I'd rather not, in the sense, because I think all, you know, the, 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 where, where students are going themselves and studying languages, Japanese and, and Chinese is important, and as Andrew said, we can't afford to do all. Um, nor do I, I don't want to wring my hands though and say that it's all it's all lost and, and so on, because you know, everyone here is proof that people are interested in yeah. engaging with the region. Why did you do it, and why did those who are watching this? Why do, why are they involved in the program? They clearly see that there are opportunities for them, and so their families. Um, might be persuaded that it's resulted in opportunities for their kids and, and their other extended family. So parents are somewhere along the line making decisions influencing their kids before they enrol to, to enrol in not in, or not in Bahasa Indonesia, for example. So we do have a situation where there are now less than 50 studying in uh, the ANU, for example, which is a premier source of our Bahasa Indonesia expertise for the country. Um, but you know, we, it is within our power to change that. Um, the, clearly, there is a role for government to invest more in that. But as Andrew said, we can't do it all. But it is up to the community to identify that there are opportunities, there are reasons, and there, there are compelling re personal reasons to, for people to invest in, in, a, in an Asian language. I should say, it's also not just uh, incumbent on young people. I mean, I only picked up my third language as an adult, and then my fourth now. So. Not always lost. <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience, Cam. Thanks so much. And great job, Soraya. Impeccable emceeing. Um, hi, I'm Cameron. Uh, I was an NCP scholar in 2019. I was the ASEAN fellow then. Um, I had a few questions. You can kind of choose which one um, you want to answer. My first question is about internationalisation of campuses. Um, I think an experience a lot of international students feel, particularly um, my friends from Southeast Asia is feelings of isolation on campus and struggles connecting with domestic students. We talked about how the experiences of those students in Australia is really foundational to how they talk about Australia overseas. In the context of a lot of um, cuts to universities uh, at the moment, uh, but also the lingering problems of those students connecting anyway, what, do, what role can students play and what should universities be doing to make um, campuses better experience for international students. Um, so the second question is, once those students go home, I think a lot of my friends from Southeast Asia are experiencing um, a huge proliferation in the gig economy. And I suppose a conversation about education is a conversation about jobs. A lot of these people going home and there's 
um, a lot of jobs doing freelance and a lot of secure work. So I suppose my question was, um, when Australia invests in the region, how do we um, advocate for secure work? Or uh, is that something that we really care about in our foreign policy? I suppose a third question, because there's a lot of NCP people watching, is um, what when people can't travel overseas right now, what should they be doing um, to keep building on their Asia expertise and to engage with the region, engage with young people from across the region? Andrew, I might bring you into the mix if you'd like to get us started. Yeah, look, it, it, it's um, it's a it's a complex complex um, problem, and, and it and it's not just you know one with Southeast Asians. I mean, it, and and I think not just one in in Australia either. There's, you know, I I saw um a little while probably a, a year two years ago now some some studies that were um, commenting on the experiences that. Um, Chinese students had had at, at, at US universities, and you know there was a kind of a, I guess, a sense that that those students were coming to the universities, and actually going home with with weaker um, English language skills than they had come to America um, with. And anecdotally, you know, you hear similar sorts of stories in in Australia as well. So, you know, so, so I do I do think the university model. Um, you know, need, needs to be to be looked at in that in that respect because you know there there has been, I think, a tendency just to churn through um, students as you know as as fee payers without thinking about um, you know the value of those students as as sort of future and call it assets for want of a better description to the nation and how we sort of build alumni plans and you know like 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 has been done with the new Colombo plan the sort of the cohort. Of alumni and that connectivity um, that we have to have, because if we, if we don't do that, then the product that we're offering is going to be degraded. And and in fact, I just saw um, um, not not too too long ago, um, you know, a, a, a survey which which suggested that uh, students, so like you know, when when parents were asked um, in, internationally, where would you send your kids if they were going to university overseas, Australia used to be in the top three. Of those, it was US, UK, Australia. Um, in 2021, Australia doesn't feature in that that top three list anymore. Now, part of that's because the borders are closed, and and we all understand why that is. Um, but 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 you know we we're operating in a in a very very competitive world, um, and technology has also now added another dimension to that. And so we've actually got a, you know I mentioned before that you know education was our fourth largest export. Um, you know, we, we can't take that for granted. It won't be our fourth largest export if we don't invest in it. Um, and and so that means making the experience on campus good for the students as well. I notice we're coming close to time. So I might, Gabby, I might ask you maybe to share comments on Cam's second question. That was, what's Australia's role in investing in secure jobs in ASEAN for returning students? I was happy to answer the first one. Oh, well, <laughs> I got in first, Gabby. <laughs> um, well, look, I, you know, I run a defence company, so um, uh, security is incredibly important for my business. Um, but that whole gig economy piece that is happening, uh, you know, it's, again, that's something that's going to be, you know, it's a disruptive change to uh, how we do business. So. We should be certainly investing um, as a nation into that um, secure networks, if you like, that give us that opportunity to work um, across borders. Um, you know, so yeah, I would say I'm not sure if I've answered your question though. Did I? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Ray, did you have any final comments before we close up? Uh, I think your third question, if I remember, was um, what can we do when? Overseas for 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 the students who have gone back home. Oh, so students and families can't go overseas. <clears throat> no, sorry, who can't go overseas? Um, look, I'm not going to and try and suggest we invent a new program. Uh, we we are all we are all we all have to deal with the reality of of our, of our border policy. Um, very much like everyone else who's involved in engaging with the region, we just need to make sure we we keep on pedalling, and we keep on engaging with the networks that we have and broadening them out. So, um, <clears throat> what, like I know that there is, where, where we have been able to travel, we've done that, but clearly not everyone can. Um, so, uh, 
the online world uh, has, I've seen some examples where we've, we have been able to make genuine new connections with counterparts in the region. And <clears throat> everyone's waiting for the moment we can turn that into a face-to-face -face interaction. So uh, Southeast Asia, much like the rest of Asia, prizes that kind of personal interaction. Uh, what might work in Europe or America, America if we talk online, but if we can make that as a promise to our new networks in Southeast Asia that we are going to visit, we are going to meet them face to face when the time is ready, it's, it's, it holds enormous potential for us and it's, it's a necessity really. Okay. Thanks very much. I think sadly that's all we have time for this evening. Um, I feel like we've covered a fair bit of topic uh, content this evening coming from how we can reform the Australian education system here and things we might need to be reconsidering and prioritising, but also how do we continue engaging with the region in an education sense, noting that the borders are closed. So um, thank you very much for joining us here today. For those of us uh, here at the Diplomatic Academy, there is an opportunity for some networking and drinks afterwards, so I'd really encourage you to stay and continue some of these conversations. Uh, the next Momentum series session is taking place on the 22nd of April in Sydney, and that one will focus on digital inclusion. So I encourage you all to keep an eye out for some ads for that. Thanks very much this evening. Thank you. Thank you.